So I'll just take this opportunity to uh, check in, see how everybody's doing. Look like you're barely awake. I know it's a little early. Anybody have any issues getting project one done? <laughs> so you're going to go fix the VS Code extension. Excellent idea. I really like that. That's that's that is a go getter kind of attitude. In a particular, yeah, in a particular arrangement. Okay. Interesting. No, well, I would argue that that actually is a bug in the extension. Oh, okay. That's the best way to deal with bugs. Document them. Um, I once submitted a bug report on a VMware workstation where I actually had found that there was a bug in the way it was handling a particular USB device. And so I happened to have a USB analyzer. There's also one built into VMware. So I was able to collect a USB log from inside of the software, inside the hypervisor, and also from the actual USB bus itself. And I submitted this entire thing, a complete description of the, of the problem, the piece of hardware, the, 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 what it should have actually done, what I actually observed in all of this data. And I, the response I got back a couple of weeks later was, this is the most comprehensive bug report we have ever received. And we are going to fix it by documenting that we don't support that USB device. So great. Well, that's absolutely wonderful. It was, um, and it was, it was a, a device. The device itself was actually just a uh, card reader. It read a uh, chip on the back of a, uh, a, a. It was a access card. It's actually a Microsoft access card, and they had an embedded chip inside of it with a certificate on it. So reading the certificate, and since I didn't want to run any of the crap that Microsoft liked to put on people's machines. I didn't work for Microsoft as a contractor. I uh, just simply put it inside of a virtual machine. And VMware has always been a very good virtual machine manager for Windows. In fact, even today, they, I had to do some work on a camera. And the camera you talk to, you, you offload the pictures with a USB connection from this 20 year old camera. And it didn't work under Hyper-V. I could not get XP to work under Hyper-V, but put it under VMware Workstation, no problems, worked great. Absolutely perfect. And I got to uh, take sketchy 20-year-old software. Well, this software wasn't sketchy. The place I got it from was sketchy because getting Adobe Photoshop Elements 3.0 from any legitimate source can't do that these days. So sometimes you just buy it from some sort of sketchy website and, and it worked. But of course, it was also inside of a virtual machine, so I didn't really care that much. Um, and you know, for 20 bucks, it was a good solution to the problem. That was a very interesting case uh, where someone was accused of crimes, criminal defendant um, who had actually already been found guilty, but they're they're appealing and they wanted evidence because at least one of the pictures, I never actually saw that picture. All I ever saw was the metadata for that picture. Uh, but the metadata on the picture said that in fact it had been created by Adobe Photoshop Elements 3.0, hence why I was running that software. And the timestamp on the file and the timestamp in the picture were exactly the same. And it's like, how could this happen? And it's like, well, the camera wasn't going to actually put Adobe Photoshop Elements 3.0 as the creator inside of the uh, XF metadata of the file. I'm like, but I'd have to confirm that. So that's why I ended up with a camera, this Canon camera from like night, uh, from 2005. And I could confirm that indeed, no picture you took was going to say Adobe Photoshop Elements 3.0. And then I ended up doing a bunch of extra work to figure out what, what, if any way, you could possibly explain this combination of metadata elements. 
And this is germane to today's topic because a lot of what we're going to be talking about is trying to determine the order of events. One of the challenges in distributed system, and, and this is pre-lecture, I'm not actually really starting yet. Um, one of the challenges in distributed systems is figuring out in what order did things happen? And you think that's pretty easy. Well, how hard could it possibly be to provide a definitive sequence of events of things that I didn't actually observe? And make sure that it agrees with your definitive sequence of events for things that you may or may not have observed. And to do this at eight o'clock in the morning. I'm um, sorry, quarter of four. I love the broken clock. It does really help this particular discussion. Somewhere there is ah, oh, it's eight o'clock. Great, perfect. I can I can rock and roll. Um, so I did some testing. Hopefully, people who are watching the stream or the recording afterwards won't have problems hearing me. I maxed the gain everywhere I could. So hopefully that'll be a little bit better. Anybody recognize this image? Do you know what it's called? <laughs> something, something memory. Perfect. Yes, that's exactly it. Not bad for 8 o'clock in the morning. Sorry, quarter of four. Um, it's called The Persistence of Memory by Salvador Dali. And I picked this particular image because of how important time is when we discuss distributed systems. That was my inspiration. For it. Um, it belongs, uh, it is in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. So the next time you go to New York City, check it out. Anybody been to New York City before? You know, there's actually a direct flight from Vancouver to New York City on JetBlue. Um, Air Canada flies to New Jersey, which is no longer considered to be part of New York City. Newark Airport off the New York City list. I don't know why. It didn't move or anything. Nothing moved. They just changed the boundary. People do these kinds of things. All right. So we want to be able to remember things. And almost everything we are concerned about are things that we need to remember. We're building a sharded key value store in project five because that's a really dumb, simple, very effective kind of database. Databases are all about remembering things. Uh, we're not going to spend a huge amount of time talking about it, but one of the areas in distributed systems where remembering things is important is, is actually unstructured data, distributed file system. And I have a little bit of experience working with distributed file system. I um, directly to a distributed file system called the Andrew file system, AFS. That was the competitor to NFS. And they's probably still use distributed file systems. I don't really think about it, though. It doesn't really. It's the same set of problems. How do I get agreement amongst a bunch of different computers as to what actually happened? So let's get through the logistics stuff because there's always logistics stuff. Um, if you haven't completed the collaboration quiz, please do that. It's a pass or fail. There's no way I can give you 75% credit for it. So it's just you saying, yeah, I know, I'm not actually supposed to cheat, and I understand what cheating does or does not mean. I'm kind of surprised. Usually I get people who ask very detailed, nitpicky questions about this. Nobody in this course has done that yet. So. Um, and here's the dirty trick. Project One's deadline is now actually next Monday. Most people uh, in the course have already completed it. And so that's why it's a dirty trick. You didn't. You could have. You could have delayed it another week. Um, I haven't received any feedback from anybody who said they thought it was particularly challenging. It shouldn't have been. It wasn't intended to be. Uh, the challenge for the biggest challenge seemed to be wrapping your head around the fact that there really wasn't very much to do. But what you did was you actually got moving, got your hands on the framework, you 
poked around through it and you didn't really have a lot of time pressure to do that. People who are getting added to, from the wait list, and I got an email over the weekend saying that they had the whole scramble because there was a what was it, 436S Scott County. And so people have been bounced around and they didn't want to increase the size of this course because they um, don't have more TAs. As I said, you know, if you want to add 20 more people, I don't have a problem with that. I can go with that. So, well, I can't give you more TAs. I made the offer assuming you wouldn't be able to do that, but that's fine. It's also the first time I've taught at UBC, so they're feeling a little cautious about that. Can you blame them after this is the third lecture now? Uh, the Project 2 deadline is still the same deadline, which is next Monday. You like that Monday evening deadline instead of Sunday, so you actually you actually had um, a little less overlap because I know that everybody likes to make it use Sunday. And, um, I don't care. Honestly, the deadline's kind of arbitrary. And if you can't make it by the 23rd, then feel free to extend it out. Um, you will notice that on grade scope at 12.01 a.m. on January 24th, all of the original uh, submission projects will go away. And I've created a set of parallel ones that uh, that will be for, for people who are submitting late so you get the failed score. And here's the, the, the plus to that. Um, in the end, I will take the greater of the two scores. So if you work on it, and it's not going to, it shouldn't happen for project two either, but projects three, four, and five, you might very well hit this. Well, five deadline is the deadline. You it will take the greater of the two. So if you really screw up up to the deadline, you can still work on it and you'll get something for it. Uh, January 23rd is the no penalty drop date. After that, you're going to get a W, and people go, oh, W's, oh, those are horrible. You, you know what? Um, I've done grad admissions here for. Uh, the department a couple of years, probably reviewed about 500 different applications. I can tell you how much W counts against you. Not at all. Pretty much nobody cares. In fact, if anything, sometimes it means, hey, you can figure out when you're a little overloaded. So don't sweat it. For those of you who are graduating, no employer is going to care. They're barely, maybe, going to care about your grades. On the first job, and after that, no, no one will care. No one's going to ask you for a copy of your transcript. No one's going to ask you what your what your grades were in your courses. Maybe if you go to grad school, maybe. Uh, TA office hours actually are posted. I bludgeoned them into picking some office hours, so there is a post on Piazza now with those office hours. Probably should have updated the slide, but I didn't. Um, I'm doing office hours on Tuesday. I'm just four fifty. Is it three to four? I put the wrong hour there. All right, it's correct on the on Piazza. Though. I did it yesterday. Nobody showed up. I didn't expect anybody to. So, if you're feeling bored, you can go watch the hour-long monologue that I recorded. Um, I did that on Zoom, actually, so it wasn't stream. Uh, Discord, I'm not going to stream it, and it's more casual. Uh, I don't plan on recording that one. So if you don't want to actually be on the record. In addition, if you just have questions, you can post them on Piazza, and I'll go through them and answer them in office hours. Here's some re recommended readings for this particular discussion. and. The links, so the, the links are in the slides. You can actually go look at them. I'll, I'll walk through it briefly. Spanner is a really cool paper about how Google decided they were going to game the system. They said, you know, and, and I'm going to be talking about this. You know, the, you know, the problem is that if we don't have a uniform, universal agreement on a global clock, then it's hard for us to, to agree on the order in which things happen. But if everybody has a global clock, by golly, this isn't an issue. 
And so what they did was they said, you know, we can spend $500,000 per data center and we can solve this problem. And that's what Spanner is. They said, we're going to put super, super fine-grained, high-resolution atomic clocks in every one of our data centers, and now we can agree on what the global sense of time is. That's a throw money at the problem and solve it kind of issue. And it only works at small scale. It will not work when you have to consider relativistic events. Anybody ever take a physics course? Relativity will screw with your head. Astronaut one goes this way at the speed of light. Astronaut two goes that way at the speed of light. How fast are they going away from each other? See, there's kind of a cap there. The speed of light. You're like, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. And this is because our intuition is what we experience and what we can experience. None of us have actually experienced this, but we don't really have a good frame of reference. Um, I was thinking I was thinking of analogies as I was coming in this morning, and I was like, you know, for all intents and purposes, we think of the Earth as flat. Now, how many of you actually think the Earth is flat? One. There's always got to be one. Yes, exactly. But in small areas, it is flat. There's a whole branch of mathematics that, that, that where we, we study manifolds. And that's effectively what happens. At a small scale, you can ignore that extra dimension. So it's an n minus one dimensional space instead of an n dimensional space. Because you know, the, the, the other dimension just doesn't change enough for us to worry about. That's great. And so a lot of the problem here is your intuition is limited to this manifold. But in fact, we're now making the space large enough that you have to worry about it. I mean, we know how to do that. We were able to take a satellite and put it in an L2 Lagrangian uh, orbit around the sun from the Earth with 384 different points of failure and actually pull it off. Think about that when you're working on Project 5 and tearing your hair out. Uh, the Lamport clock paper is, is really the fundamental paper that got people thinking about this time and ordering. And it's not like he pulled it out of his magic hat. It was clearly an issue. It was clearly something that, that people were wrestling with. But Lamport has this crazy hair and is still in his, he's in his late 70s now, and he's still doing research um, at Microsoft. That's why the, the link to the paper is actually off of a Microsoft website. The network time protocol is in fact a standard protocol that was developed in the late 1980s to do time synchronization so that your computer, which runs the network time protocol, your computer can keep your clock accurate to within about 10 milliseconds. It's pretty cool. Um, Flash Boys is a book that it was recommended when I took 538W here. I only took three classes at UBC. And that was one. And it is about what's called high-frequency trading. And high-frequency trading, when you first hear about it, you think, wow, that must be something really cool. And it turns out, you know what it is? It's the ability to build faster network paths. So in high-frequency trading, you go to your broker and you put an order in to buy 100 shares of Apple at the market. And then your broker, Robinhood's good for this. They actually do this. Your broker then sends it to somebody else. And that somebody else then takes that order and they, they forward it to the market. At the same time, they send a buy order, I love this, to the market as well. Except they send it over a faster path. Milliseconds faster. But that's all it takes. And that means they get to buy it at the price you would have paid. And now they get to immediately put it back on the market, because they have an agent on the computer, that then puts it back on the market at a higher price. So that's the price you pay. And they get to pocket the difference. That's effectively, in a very hand-wavy sort of way, but that's effectively what it's about. And what's really interesting about that book, it was written by a, um, a Canadian banker for RBC who was working in New York City. 
Wall Street and uh, figured out what was really going on there. He talks about them, them, people spending a lot of money to build faster network connections so they could front run orders. And we're talking lots and lots and lots of money. So time is important. The time it takes for something to travel from point A to point B is something we can't actually control. We have a known lower bound on that. It cannot go faster than the speed of light in whatever the medium is that you're using to transmit the signals. But if you put a single piece of fiber from here to New York City, it's going to be faster than if you use the standard internet to send things. Because that's going to be hop, store, hop, store, hop, store, blah, blah, blah. How much is that piece of fiber from here to New York City going to cost you? A lot more than sending a packet over a public internet. So in order for it to be financially viable, it has to actually really be faster. And it has to really be worth something. But it was. Pretty cool. Um, they made a movie out of it. There's actually a, a, a paper I found while I was looking at Flash Boys 2, which is about doing the same thing on blockchains. And we will be talking about blockchains because, of course, it wouldn't be a, a cool class if we weren't talking about um, uh, your random coin. Anybody do any crypto? First Bitcoin I bought, I paid $110 for. I actually worked with a guy who was who started mining Bitcoin when he worked in the computer lab for the his undergrad university, and he was mining on the computers in the lab. He paid his tuition bills with the money he was mining that way. That was a long time ago, probably 10 years ago. Um, and of course, if he just simply held on to it, yeah, because the, the first Bitcoin sold for six cents. And of course, there's a whole bunch of Bitcoins that somebody didn't pay anything for at all that are that, that just started moving. Um, I'm going to talk about alternative path one today. I haven't really talked much about that. So uh, the objectives in this one, what I called challenge mode, was you need to find a project. This is part of the challenge. I'm not going to give the, you a project and say, here, you go do this. You actually have to say, how do I find it? Because the first thing is you're going to go, what, how do I even find a project? Well, that's part of the challenge. You need to pick a team, three people. You have both shared and individual responsibilities. Your shared responsibilities are to define the project. You have to agree. What are we building? Then you have to define what do we have to do in order to build this thing, the requirements. And then you have to say, here's what these pieces are going to look like. Here's how they're going to interact with the other pieces in the system. And then you're going to go off and build one of those pieces of the project. You've got a, an agreed upon spec, and of course you're gonna find bugs in it. it. Happens. That's part of the process. It's part of, of learning and figuring this kind of thing out. Um, and you have to make sure that your piece conforms to those project requirements. If you need to change the requirements, you have to get the agreement of the other people in, in the team. Then there's a feedback element there. And it's like, you need to be talking to each other but you're, you're responsible for that piece, but you can be talking to other people because you're interacting with them, you're working with them. So how do I evaluate that? I look at the project. Is the project useful as a distributed system? I mean, if you come up with some really cool graphical thing with dancing bears and, and, and I don't know, mermaids, it might be really awesome. But if it doesn't have anything to do with the distributed systems, it's not going to have any, any value. So it has to be something that, has a serious distributed systems component to it. How good is your project proposal? How good is your report at the end that says this is what we actually built and this is what we learned? Because if you can't learn to be introspective about your own work, you're going to find real the real world is a lot harder. And this isn't, I don't want a throwaway piece of bullshit coursework. This is something that in the end, you want to be able to show to people and say, hey, we did this as a really cool project. It was, it was an interesting exercise. 
And then we're going to look at your implementation. What was the value to the project? What was the value of the feedback? Since you're going to be using Git, you're going to be you're creating issues. I'm going to sit down and look at your issues. I'm going to say, did you communicate things well with the other person? Um, I, I told you, I saw this really interesting discussion on Reddit about people and they hated pure feedback because usually they would just get shit remarks like, oh, good job, or, or something useless like that. That's not useful feedback. You're not going to get credit if that's the kind of feedback you go, oh, that's great, or you suck. Neither of those are useful. A good piece of feedback is, I found this problem. Here's what I think is going on. Here's what I think it needs to do. What did it do? What should it have done? Why do I think it happened? That's actionable. That's a good piece of feedback. That gets you, gets you points. We're going to look at it as well. much about your code style, but if I look at your code and I go, what actual heck do you do? I'm not going to give you a huge amount of credit for it. And it doesn't have to be beautiful. I'm not asking for beautiful code. I, I've written a lot of code in my life, and my code actually generally gets pretty good compliments because people can follow it. Because I've learned over the years that writing Clear code is very important. Even if I don't use every little trick to try and make sure I can do this in one line, I didn't write a lot of C code. And you can do really nasty, ugly things in C. But I don't want you to have to sit there and go, OK, what is the order of operations here? No. Break things out. You don't have to optimize the actual implementation of code. Let the compiler optimize the output. That's the compiler's job, not yours. Your job is to make sure that the code itself is as clear and easy to maintain as possible. And how valuable were you to other team members, your peer feedback, and um, we'll review that as well. Uh, what are the benefits to you? So what do you get out of this? Well, you get a team director project. You get to choose your team members. Biggest complaint I heard in, in uh, team-based classes is being assigned to other people. And there's always that one person who ends up feeling like they're carrying the group. Whether they are or not doesn't make any difference. You pick the team here. I'm not picking them. At the end, you can't blame me for that choice. All you can do is look in the mirror and go, you wow. Or you picked a really good team. Um, you get to work on something useful. I encourage you to make it free open source software. That raises the bar. I don't expect anybody's going to have like a, a, a really amazing kick-ass project, but I would point out that Linux pretty much started as this kind of a project. So it is possible. It's not easy. And it can add up to 40% of your final grade. What's the cost? Teams can be difficult. Oh, so-and-so did less work than I did. Okay. Why is that? What did you do about it? How did you handle that? Talk to them? Or did you just sit there and bitch about them when they weren't around? Which one is useful? I hear people kind of giggling at that because I'm betting you've done this before, haven't you? Why is it you direct that project? Which is, again, one of the real benefits here. Say, I did this project. I drove this project. My team and I put this project together. We agreed on the specifications. We built this code. We provided it out to the rest of the community. And we got feedback, or we didn't get feedback, but we did this. And you can point to people. You can point that people to that code and you can say, I did this. And if you want to keep working on it, and I've already had one, one person talking about potential for building a project with a longevity beyond just this class, I encourage it. Um, here's an example project. Do not do this project. I specifically picked a project that you should not choose because it's too big. So the labs here are all done in Java. I would prefer if they were done in Rust. So the project would be, how do I take this and convert all this code from Java to Rust? Why would I want to use Rust? Java sucks, but aside from that. So the reason that people are using Rust is because they understand and appreciate the benefits of the constraints that the memory safety provides. Rust is a compiled language. It does not have a garbage collector, so it is in uh, can be very, very fast. It's still a, a young language, but it is gaining a lot of traction. You can still write buggy code with Rust. It's just harder to write buggy code with Rust than it is to write with C. 
the vast majority of my system's code is in C. I know how to write good, bug-free C. I know how to implement a lot of the exact techniques that Rust builds into the language. It drives people crazy. Um, I use a, one of the projects that, that I built is you have a library and you pass pointers to pointers in the library and pointers to pointers confuse the hell out of people, but it's the only way to build memory safety into C. Because if I can't set your pointer to null, you're going to have a use after free. If I set it to null, at least you'll know that you did a use after free. Rust will do that at compile time. I'll have to do it at, at runtime. But I've learned the hard way that the best place to do it, if you can't do it at compile time, C compiler. Um, some C compilers, well, there are extensions to the C compilers that will, will do some of this for you. But if you can't do it at compile time, you want to do it at, at runtime, and you want to do it as aggressively as possible. It's pretty cool when you can say, you just touched this null pointer, or you sent me a null pointer, and I'm not going to handle that. Versus, you know, it just blows up. Because sometimes it works. That's the real problem with not having memory safety, is that sometimes, like 99.9% .9 of the time, it works. And then you ship it to the customers, and they start using it, and it blows up. And it's way harder to debug things when it's at the customer site. And it's when it's on your own machine. So if you say, I have one now, but I will. Works on my machine. The answer is you're not testing it well enough. And your customer is not running on your machine. And it happens. In the um, so big project idea, but that's the kind of thing that would be a legit uh, Uh, last thing to note, I did, I, I said I was going to do the networking stuff. I decided that it was way too much. And I don't want to displace what I think is the important part of this course for more review material. So I recorded it. It's on, um, I put a link to the recorded video. And you can hear the sound on that because I was actually wearing a, a, a full headset with a microphone in front of my my mouth. I'm not going to cover that stuff in class. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them in class, at office hours, on Piazza, whatever, whatever works for you. And that's and then that you are an ideal candidate for not doing one of the alternative paths. I mean, seriously, is if, if you want to have a, a conversation. We can talk about that. How do I find these things? And it's like, you know, I find them all the time. So yesterday, uh, somebody's asking about us uh, using CRDTs, um, which are a kind of distributed data structure that, that that are good for building eventually consistent databases. And I'm talking to another friend of mine, and he's telling me about React. And I'm like, oh. And so literally, I completely unrelated conversations. I go look at React, and I'm going, oh, look. React is a distributed database implemented in Erlang that uses CRDTs. Because uh, the friend of mine who's actually giving a talk for his company about CRDT next weekend. So honestly, these things just kind of like appear, for me at least. If I start looking for them, they, they appear. Uh, if you don't know, you can actually just Google distributed systems projects. And you know what? will find that there's like lots and lots of stuff that pops up. It's actually not super hard. But if that's not within your wheelhouse, then either talk to other people, talk to me, talk to the TAs, or uh, don't do that. Just stick with the projects. The projects are a lot more guided. They're not easy, but they're guided. Well, that was the whole reason I gave these. I said there's always the completionists who have to do everything they can in the course. So, of course, you know, hey, yeah, you can do twice as much work. You don't need to sleep, do you? I'm fine with that. I can't commit to the other instructor, but I'm fine with that. I'm also going to keep 
I will take that into consideration though, right? Is that you actually had two things you're getting credit for there. So I'm going to have, I'm going to expect a little bit better, you know, you're going to be able to put a little more time into this. Because in fact, distributed, mach distributed machine learning is a legitimate area for implementing a distributed system. I mean, there are huge things about graph processing, which is basically what neural networks are, uh, and how you cut them, and how you deal with them, how they scale. There's a really cool paper, if you really want to go down that path, there's a very cool paper I will point you to called Cost, which is a five-page paper. It's not particularly difficult, where, where basically the person who wrote it, it's a great paper because the three people who wrote it, none of them were employed at the time. So it all says unaffiliated, unaffiliated, unaffiliated on the paper. They had just all like changed jobs or lost jobs. Uh, and it's a very heavily cited paper because it basically said, you know what? We've got all these big distributed graph algorithms for things like machine learning. And I can run, I can build something in, I don't remember if we did it in Go or Rust. It was Go. But it might have been Rust. And I can make them run faster than your multi-node distributed algorithm. I can make it run faster on my MacBook. It's a great paper. It really challenges you to think about what is the cost of all of this communication. I, I've mentioned this several times. I'll keep mentioning it. Cost of moving data in distributed systems can dominate the performance, as in make it slow. Any other questions? And I'm willing to keep having conversations on this, uh, the, the project. Um, hot OS, boss hot OS, McSherry, M-C-S-H-E-R-R-Y. Frank McSherry was the first author on it. He's the one who wrote that code. If you can't find it, drop me a note on Discord. I will find it. I have copies of it. It's a great paper. It gets very heavily uh, cited. Any questions about the class? Any questions about the previous lecture? Any funny stories to share? Good. I didn't think there would be any, so let's go. Let's start with today's failure. On Wednesday, January 11th, 2023, at 7.15 in the morning, the Federal Aviation Administration in the United States put a complete ground hold on all U.S. domestic flights. I would classify this as a pretty big failure kind of case. Notice that it's last week. Yeah, I didn't pull something from ancient history. This was last week. They still haven't really finished analyzing it, but they, uh, they have reaffirmed that it was an, a, a corrupted database file. This is how easy it is for things to go wrong. It's like the Facebook case where it was um, a misconfiguration. Oops, Ooh, this is really bad. I, mean, I didn't even hit the Southwest Airlines one, which was what, the week before that. And that was also a distributed failure, distributed system failure. This is the downside to distributed systems. They are extraordinarily high impact when they do fail. So if you want to work with distributed systems, be prepared for dealing with failure. People who work at Amazon in Amazon Web Services, many of them end up doing what they call pager duty, which basically means you're on the hot seat at least once a month for, for a couple of days. So if something goes wrong, you're the person who has to wade in and figure this out. That is a very important set of skills here. This is why I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about ordering and clocks and whatnot, because understanding this will help you build models of looking for what could have gone wrong. How did this fail? What was the order of events? Um, apparently, they've started giving everybody in here CS education classes as people are like, can I have the learning goals first? I'm like, I didn't have learning goals when I was undergrad. And you did stay, my props would come in and they'd start writing on the chalkboard, which in the morning were always clean. The cleaning staff would always wash the chalkboards off so there was no chalk residue left on them. 
And there were these big chalkboards you could slide up and down. It was great. Now they do whiteboards. Chalkboards are kind of a thing of the past, but they're cool. Because with, with whiteboards, the whiteboard markers will look like they're going to function, but you open them up and they're dried out. Chalk, you know whether or not it's alive or dead because chalk is like a nub. You're actually writing there and you can't hold on to it. They both come in color. So we're going to talk about what does time mean here? What are the challenges about this? Why is it difficult for us to reason about this? Wow. Scared somebody away. Uh, I'm dropping this class. I'm going to go take, I don't know, whatever the other alternatives were. We're going to talk about logical clocks and logical time. Oh, look, it's quarter of four in the morning or in the afternoon. I don't know which. That's the beauty of a 12-hour clock. 24-hour clocks, not ambiguous. 12-hour clocks, right, twice a day. 24-hour clocks that are broken can only be right once a day. Um, and we're going to talk about ordering models because we use clocks to define the order of events in a system. The challenge here isn't doing this with a single, single observer. A single observer gets to say the order of events because they can say, this is the order I saw them happen in. When we start talking about relativistic effects, the problem is that as we get further and further away from the thing that we're observing, the time it takes for us to get that information grows. So if you're closer to something than I am, you're going to see it as happening sooner. So let's see, you're there, I'm, I'm standing here, you're there, he's there, and he does something, you see it before I see it. You do something, I see it about the same time. I do something, you see it before he sees it. And so our observation of the order in which things happen is going to be different because the amount of time it takes for us to just get the message is going to vary. Now, that really wasn't enough distance for it to make much. It didn't matter. Um, apparently, Grace Hopper used to wander around with uh, pieces of wire that were about, let's see, that would be 27 centimeters long. And the reason she did that was because that was one nanosecond. The speed of an electron through a piece of copper wire would travel about 27 centimeters. 11 inches for those of you I'm using material units um, in one nanosecond. And so we can think of distance and time as being somewhat interchangeable. But you'll notice I'm always very careful to qualify that based upon the speed of light in that medium. Stop clicking. Oh, because I clicked the wrong button. Probably help if I click the right button. Okay, so we have this idea of physical time. We have our, our computer, our watch, probably not a real watch, it's probably a smart watch now. Anybody actually still use a physical watch? Yeah, they work still. It's kind of amazing. They don't talk to your phone. Well, maybe you have one that does, mine does. But mine actually keeps really good time. It doesn't even need to be wound or anything. It's like magic pick it up and it tells me the, the precise time. Well, I think it's the precise time. I just assume that it's always right because it's a quarter to four. Um, I can call a function from my operating system that will tell me, like get time of day. I can't believe how optimized the get time of day function actually is in Linux. It turns out that it uses a piece of shared kernel user mode state. So when you call get time of day, we don't make a system call to get the time of day. Because we do it so often, it's too expensive. Because, you know, the extra 100 nanoseconds to call across the user kernel boundary, that adds up. What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? Over and over. And then we have physical clocks. Oh, quarter four. I, and I'm rounding. It's actually 16. So physical clocks in devices actually have limitations. Computers use oscillators, crystals that oscillate at a particular frequency, use that frequency. 
to determine what time it is. Now, you're gonna, maybe you're sitting there going, well, that's a weird way of counting time, but I actually have to tell you that the official metric time standard is in fact based on oscillations. Anybody know what oscillation? Cesium atom. They actually watch the oscillations of a cesium atom. So when you talk about atomic clocks, they actually use cesium atoms as a particular weight um, to determine. And it's a number of vibrations of that particular cesium atom. But there's a very precise standard for what it means for one second. I don't, I don't really use metric time. There is a metric time. Not even the French use it. Like 100 minutes per hour. And part of that is because we physically wander around a star at not anything that's equally divisible by the amount of time that it takes for our planet to turn. The rotation of the Earth and the rotation around the sun don't mesh especially well. That's why we end up with things like leap days, leap seconds. We have to adjust our clocks. Um, so our computers can actually drift. They can tell the time it's slightly different than the official time. So somebody with that cesium clock, like Google, willing to put in atomic clocks in their data centers for a half million dollars a piece. That's one way it's all. That's a really high accuracy clock, but we're not going to put one of those half million dollar clocks on every single computer. So what we're going to want is a protocol that allows our computers to talk to the really, really accurate clocks and get as close as we can to the really, really accurate clocks. And this is the way the, the network time protocol actually functions. We have different accuracies. Uh, there are multiple strata of the clocks. And the highest accuracy clocks are uh, stratum one clocks. But I have to send messages back and forth across the network with some level of jitter within it. So I need a technique for figuring out what the time is within the bounds of the variation of the time it takes to send the message back and forth. And that's what the network time protocol does. Like I said, it, it can get down to about 10, 10 milliseconds quite easily. And there are protocols, versions of that, you can get more accurate. There is no universal time. Have you ever heard of the global positioning system? You probably know it by its acronym, GPS. I see a couple of heads shake, shaking yes. I'm assuming the rest of the people have never heard of GPS before. So um, it turns out that we have this, this satellite network up in orbit around the planet that, that we can use to triangulate where we're actually located um, with high accuracy, about 10 meters. actually hard. GPS satellites actually experience relativistic effects. They actually experience time dilation. And we know what that time dilation is because it exactly matches a theory of the general theory of relativity that explains what that time dilation should be. So we actually know and we can correct for that. So this is the, when things get really tricky. We're talking about very, very careful precision here. So we got, we got these really expensive solutions to this problem, and we've got some techniques that can get us kind of close. But the close isn't necessarily good enough for our purposes in really reasoning about distributed systems. When we build real systems, we may very well make choices, but we need to understand what those limitations are. So we understand what we have to correct for. A Lamport clock, Leslie Lamport, crazy hair, Brilliant guy, will give us lots and lots to think about in this course. A Lamport clock is a formalization of, of this idea that we have a, a scalar clock value, sequence number. That's really all a Lamport, Lamport clock is. The observation here, and because of course we're going to try and generalize this, is that the Lamport clock is a monotonic clock that never rolls back. That's really important. 
One of the downsides of using NTP is that it will adjust your clock backwards. Well, now I no longer have an ordering, do I? A monotonic clock never rolls backwards. It always returns either the same time or uh, uh, a numerically higher time. Yes. Nothing happened. If you read the clock and you read the clock again, it could actually be the same, and it's okay. But what the second condition there is when we, when something happens, when we observe something, we increment our clock. So if nothing happens, we don't need to increment the clock because I don't know. It's like the tree that falls in the woods and no one's there to hear, sort of thing. So that second condition is what's going to make it happen. Is what is going to satisfy your concern, which is why didn't the clock roll forward? Because nothing happened. The moment something happens, we roll that clock forward. We're going to actually play some tricks to start reasoning about this, but I, I don't want to do that quite yet. So this defines the happens before relationship in an order of events. We like using integers because people naturally have an ordering of integers. There's this mathematician side of me that always gets the heebie-jeebies when I start talking about ordering arbitrary sets because the um, any mathematician background? In? Anybody have ever heard of the axiom of choice? Uh, in ZFC arithmetic, it's all about sets. And one of the one of the things that um, Gödel proved, and it pissed Hilbert off, but he proved that in fact there are always questions in any interesting non-trivial axiomatic system that cannot be answered one way or the other. And the cool thing about that is that it means that you can make a system where you just simply assert or don't assert or assert the negation of uh, the thing you can't prove. And the axiom of choice says given any set, there's always an ordering. You can always define an ordering of in elements in the set. It's super easy when you think about integers. Well, of course there is. The problem is that when you generalize it to all sets, you end up with this, this weird proof that you can take a sphere of arbitrary size, chop it up in a particular way, put it back together, and make it any size you want. Like, whoa. But we're going to stick with it. These integers are all we need here. And everybody's comfortable with, with the idea that integers have a well-ordered property. I take any two integers. One integer is less than the other integer, or they are equal. And you could add the one of them is greater than, but it's, it's the same as the one is less than. They are either equal, or one is less than the other. Now I have an ordering. Why does this matter? Well, we need to understand causality. Yes. What is the maximum integer? There you go. Infinity isn't actually an integer, is it? It's a concept. So there may be a pragmatic limit to that because we only work with finite size memories. So I can only store something that's as big as I'm willing to, to allocate space for. But that's, and that's, that's a, a clock rollover problem, but that's a pragmatic implementation problem. And the simplest solution to that is to say, when I do that, I'm just going to reboot the system and make and start all over again. Or I'm going to look at it and say, that was kind of a design flaw. Um, this happens. And the GPS clocks use a very small timer, and it, it rolls over like every 20 years or so. And so we, we work around it. We deal with the fact that it's going to roll over and become zero again, and we move forward with it. Uh, causality is really one of the biggest things because we want to know the order in which things happen. The real challenge here is determining causality of things I didn't observe. I'll tell you, one of the most useful debugging skills for me has been the ability to look at a crash system with wreckage strewn throughout it and work backwards from that and say, this must have been the order of events. 
even if what I now observe isn't consistent with that because I couldn't have gotten there from where I'm at right now. I've literally seen this, where you look at something, you say, why did this blow up? It says this is a null pointer, or, or no, it got, it, it, yeah, it could be a null pointer reference, but the pointer is not null, because it was null when I looked at it, but when it crashed, it wasn't null. Maybe there was only a few nanoseconds between the two, but the state changed. So instead of questioning, you know, uh, I always question my own skills, but eventually I'll get to a point where I say, this just can't have happened. It's actually hard to reason about some of these failures. But we try to fix them as possible. That happens before is really important when we start talking about distributed algorithms. So let's suppose we say, we're going to do the simple thing. I'm going to use my clock as the definitive clock. When I receive the message that says something happened, that's ground truth for me. Does this work? Here was the analogy that here's a bad analogy. But here's the analogy I came up with before. Is, um, uh, any of you ever seen a movie? Have you ever seen an inconsistency in a movie? A movie happens is they shoot the same scene over and over and over and over again, and then they patch it all together at the end. And what happens is, as hard as we try, humans suck at doing things consistently 100% of the time over and over again. So from one scene to the next scene, small inconsistencies show up. And in the movie, you can see them. You go, oh, that's a blooper. Oh, look, you know, it had a white hat in that scene, and, and they panned away, and they came back, and now it's black. So the problem is that what happened from the observer's perspective might not be the same if we switch observers. Nice, pretty picture. You know, we send a message. The order gets defined by what happened over here. This is great as long as only the person receiving them is the arbiter here. This is actually a very simple solution. This is the, I have a, um, a, a ruler. I have one entity in the system. We will see this. Uh, it's a, a common technique in database systems where you have a coordinator. And the coordinator is the one who defines the order in which things happen. You have one arbiter. But in distributed systems, I don't want single points of failure. So I don't want a coordinator. I want to have some mechanism where I have multiple participants and they each have their own perspective on what happened. And what we're looking for isn't an algorithm that will work if I just simply want to say, this is my deity and they will decide what actually happened. Instead, it's like, no, we want to actually make a distributed decision. And what you saw and what you saw need to be consistent with each other. That's a lot harder. If I just simply say, oh, almighty oracle, you now get to decide, <laughs> problem solved. None of this is interesting. You wouldn't be taking distributed systems if that were the case. But it's easy. I hope you didn't take this class because you thought it was easy. So then we get into interesting things. I'll tie it back to networking. Well, uh, how long does it take for a packet to get from point A to point B? <laughs> Who knows? You get a packet show up a couple days later. You can have a whole series. That was a whole discussion about TCP and about dealing with out of order packet delivery. So what we conclude is this isn't a viable solution for an actual distributed systems model. If all I want to do is just solve the problem, yep, picking an arbiter, great solution, works really well. So how about if we try to use the sender's clock? Hmm. So now the recipient looks at that and says, I get two messages, from two different senders, and I compare the, the clock that is now in the message. I'm putting a timestamp in the message. I compare those timestamps. That will work if I actually have a global clock. But it doesn't work very well if I've got a real world clock where things might roll backwards or there's not an agreement, or my clock says it's 16 minutes to four. All the time. Clocks aren't synchronized. So there's no, no guarantees here. They're not even guaranteed to be monotonic. 
maybe if we can make the monotonic, we might be able to get a little further progress. And we are going to get there. And that's actually going to be what we end up doing. So here's the questions we need to be thinking about. Do individual nodes in the system need to agree on a common time? How about if I flip that around and say, don't you think it would be best if they don't need to agree? Because that's a weaker constraint. So if we don't need that constraint, let's not impose it. Google said, if you impose this constraint, everybody has the same clock view, then the world gets a lot easier. You're absolutely right. But some of us have to live in a world where we can't spend $500,000 per machine in Iraq to get absolutely perfect time. In all fairness, Google only did one per data center. And in all fairness, they're not even a half million dollars. In I priced them out and buy them for about 5,000 bucks, which almost makes it viable. Can't get rid of network delays, though. Can't get rid of some of the other problems here. Network delays aren't constant, answering that question. Uh, networks do experience failures. I mean, I don't know. Anybody who's ever used UBC Secure, UBC Secure knows that networks fail kind of randomly for no particularly apparent reason. I don't know. Why did I disconnect from the network and spend the next 15 minutes trying to get it to reconnect? And it fails four times and it works the fifth. Okay, those are networks. Networks are unreliable. They're inherently unreliable. Do you trust everyone? How about you look around this room? Do you trust the people in this room? And you can look at me and go, no way. So let's talk about logical time. So we're going to use logical time instead of physical time because we want clocks that can represent the properties that we can reason about. So these times don't really have anything to do with reality now. Instead, what they have to do is with trying to order events. We don't have to have a global clock. We do have monotonicity, so they are strictly increasing. And they will allow us to define an order of events in the system. Depending on what kind of clock we use, we may have weaker or stronger guarantees. So I'm going to provide examples. I'm going to spend a lot of time on scalar clocks a little less time on vector clocks, and a very small time, amount of time on matrix clocks. There are other more complicated clock models as well, but this is a decent way of getting started. <laughs> These slides took a lot of time for me to put together because doing equations in PowerPoint with their little editor is sort of kind of like writing them in LaTeX with math mode, but not. It's way more painful. All right. So we have a process. They, 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 most of the discussions about this talk about processes. You think of this as nodes or individual processes on a computer. Doesn't doesn't matter. Same basic idea. So a process generates a series of events, and the subscript for the events indicates the process that generated them, and the superscript generate indicates the sequence of those events. So. Every event that has a successor has a happens before relationship. The notation is really just trying to capture the concept. Mathematics is about language, it's about formally describing something. I look at the notation and I really had to work through this to say, what is this actually telling me? So I'm trying to tell you what it tells me. Hopefully that will jive with what you want, what it's telling you too. Um, and furthermore, that happens before relationship works for subsequent events as well. So in other words, if there is a separation between the events, the ordering is still preserved. No cycles here. And these are definitions. Right? I'm defining these things. This is how my clock is going to work. Now I'm going to create a history, and that's the, order of, the ordered sequence of events for a given process. Every single thing the process saw that changed its state is an event. 
If the process doesn't change its state, it doesn't need to change its clock. It doesn't have any events to worry about. That's why the clock doesn't advance in that instant. It doesn't matter. We receive a message. It has a timestamp in it. We send a message. It has a timestamp plus some value. In this case, one is the example. So I've got sequencing of messages that are related. This is a causal relationship here. This is not a causal relationship. These are decoupled. This is one of the things that's going to make this complicated is because when you have distinct actors, each receiving messages, each experiencing their own events, their own reality, they might be experiencing different things at the same time. So you can think of the time. So you know an event occurs, event occurs here, and we send it here, it arrives here. So there's a gap in the time, these are timelines. The gap in real time between when a message gets sent and when it gets received. But the ordering of these events is now preserved because our clock has this monotonicity. How are we going to get this to work so that we know the sequence across our process? That's really so. What is the ordering of two non causally related events? Who knows? So, you have now been in the classroom for almost an hour. Um, can you tell me what happened in London, England in the last hour? I wasn't there. I haven't looked on the internet. I have no idea. So things that you didn't observe, they happened. And you'll agree they happened, but you'll have no insight into them. And you won't know the order in which they happened. Which is fine. Does, does it really matter what happened in London, England in the last hour? Probably not. If it does, you'll probably get a message at some point. Probably. So... Concurrent events, yes. No, I didn't. I didn't say you would agree that an event happened. I said an event happened. I'm, I'm not. I'm just saying that events happen outside of your frame of reference. Whether they were real events or imaginary events, I, I, we don't have to comment or even be able to solve yet. We will get there though. Just not in this lecture. We will be talking about Byzantine behavior later. So if E1 is not causally related to E2, in other words, it's a happens before relationship is not present, and E2 does not happen before E1, then we say that they are concurrent events. There is no defined ordering between these. Yes. In reality, yes, but our definition says we don't know the order of the events. Because there's no causal relationship between these two, they in fact could have happened in either order and it would be perfectly valid. I mean, it, so the, the problem is you, we're switching perspectives. If I'm switching to the perspective of I'm one node in this system, I can't say anything about these events and the order they occurred in. And now I switch back out into the external observer perspective and I go, I can see both of these things. This one happened before that one. And so we, I'm playing a little trick here because once we're actually inside of the system, we can't see. But if we can pull ourselves out of the system and observe the whole thing, we could see that there is an order of events. My ultimate point here is it doesn't actually matter. In the way we reason about these things, we will learn that there can be lots of events for which we know they occurred, but we don't know the order in which they occurred, and it won't matter because it didn't affect our state. It didn't change our view of the world. So no relationship means no, no well-defined order. Uh, let's see if this is just, a, you're trying to give you a nice graphic to fit with this. So we don't know. 
these two messages were sent at the same time, but they arrived at different times uh, in process three. So the ordering here is for all intents and purposes exactly the same time. When we get it here, P3 can now define the order in which it observed the event. And what we're really going to be looking for is how do we merge these things together into something we can reason about? Yes. It means that it has a happens before relationship. It either happens before is a very strong relationship. This happened, then this happened. And I know that. And I'm going to, I'm going to call that a causal relationship. It's just the, the, the time, literally. If I'm the observer and I receive this message and I sent that message, I will just simply, by definition, say they are causally related. You're looking, you're looking for some deeper meaning here, and I'm saying, no, this is just how I'm going to define it in this instance. We're going to start with a model where it can only happen on one node because that node will observe something. But what's going to happen when we're done with this is we're actually going to be able to reason about the causal relationships across the nodes as well. Because that's ultimately what we need in order to be able to make distributed decisions. But getting there is going to be able to, as the questions already reflect. OK, so logical clocks. Um, This is going to be a long lecture. Boy, very interesting. So logical clocks. So for every event inside of a, a history, a family of events, um, we have a logical clock, some logical clock called C, that produces a time. So essentially, this is how do I get a timestamp for a given event in nice formal writing. So we say that a clock is consistent if Happens before relationship events, i.e. causally related events. Preserve this with their timestamps. And then it's monotonic. Monotonicity does not require a uniform incrementing clock, by the way. It just simply requires that it always goes up. It doesn't have to go up by exactly the same amount. And that flexibility is going to get us where we need to go. So if I have two non-causally related events, I can't say anything about their timestamp. There's no ordering for the timestamps. No ordering for the events, no ordering for the timestamp. In strong clock consistency, it says, so remember, this, is, this was consistency. Um, that's the implication is only one direction. Down here, I'm going to add the implication in both directions. So if one event happens before another event, then the timestamps are ordered. But we're going to flip it around and say, and if the timestamps are ordered, then these events have a happens before relationship. That's not required by this. So this is the, the, the converse is not always true from a logic perspective. It's just a definition, right? Don't 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 get too hung up on the on the causality word. I'm saying I define causality in this system to mean that this event came before this event. That's that's all all I'm trying to define. And the reason we're using that term causality is because when we start actually thinking about it, once we've gone through this formalism, it really is going to actually mean mean that. I get a message, I make a decision to send another message because of what I received here. So, in summary, a logical clock means we have a universe of timestamps. We have a timestamp out of that universe, and we have a function that takes an event and pulls a timestamp out of that universe of timestamps. Boy, clock's over. 
very abstract language to say, yeah, I got a whole bunch of timestamps, I got a whole bunch of events, and I got a, a way of pulling a timestamp out of the universe of timestamps and assigning it to that event. Okay. Uh, an event history is a partially ordered set of events. Partially ordered is a really important term here. It's not completely ordered. And that's what's going to make it both fun and challenging for us to reason about. The function just tells us how we get the clock, how we get the timestamp. And realistically, think of it as I'm going to increment the clock. I'm going to bump that clock up. So this is going to put us into Lamport clocks. This is a link to the paper. This is all about what Lamport talked about in the 1970s. 70. Could be wrong, but long time ago. I was young. Younger than you are now. I didn't read the paper when it first came out. Just saying. So he had a small set of rules. And he said, before you execute a state change, an event, a process increments its clock value. So the clock at in process i is replaced with the clock in process i plus some value that is greater than zero. That's monotonicity. If nothing happens, I don't need to change my clock. If something happens, I receive a message or I send a message, I need to bump my clock. And here's where we start to relate it to the clock of other people. Rule two, rule two says when I get a message, it's got a timestamp in it now, and I use either the timestamp of that message or my own timestamp, and then I go execute rule one. So I take the larger of the message timestamp and my own timestamp, and regardless of which one it is, then I bump it up. So my timestamp is now greater than either of those. Now I'm starting to get some ordering across the nodes. I've fast forwarded. And then I send the message. So in the same process, if I have two events, one that is happens before the second one, then the timestamp of the first one is always less than the timestamp of the second one. This makes sense because I don't have distributed timestamps in a single process. I have one clock, one clock to rule them all. Requirement satisfied, but it's when I get multiple processes that becomes more interesting. Now. I still have the, to preserve the, the, the ordering of the timestamps. But in addition, the uh, message timestamp, notation is kind of weird here, but this is, I didn't make up this notation. Uh, the message timestamp is going to be the timestamp of, of the message, of process I's clock at the time of message A. That's going to be the timestamp I use on that. They're all the same. So I can interchange these things. It all mean the same. And then the, the timestamp at process J when message B is received is going to be the maximum of the timestamp um, of that process or the uh, next message that I receive. Do you think it'll make more sense if I repeat it or should I try and say it a different way? Okay, so in other words, I'm gonna be replacing the timestamp here for message B with the higher of my timestamp or the message that I just got timestamp plus one. It's just a funkier way of uh, basically saying the same thing. But basically the same, the same thing that here. 
just in a slightly different way. So we've got some examples here. And you can see, so the message here is sent at timestamp two. Yes. Um, message, that's the one we're about to send, right? So, oh, because rule two, sorry, rule two says then we're going to execute rule one. Rule two says execute rule one. So what we're doing is we're going to pick that value and then we are, you're right, we're going to actually increment it by one again. So we take either the in inbound message, we add one to that, or we take our clock. And in either case, then we're going to add one to it. It's just, this is now the cross-process rationale of the, same, of the same process on the previous slide. Uh, sorry. No, because the message that came in is going to have a timestamp. And we're going to increment that timestamp. Uh, let's see. Is that right? That timestamp, we're going to use our own clock. And we're going to add one to that. No, it doesn't matter, actually. If it does add two to it, it, it it'll still work, right? Um, don't think that was the intent. But again, I didn't invent the notation. I spent a lot of time putting these slides together, trying to make sure I understood the notation. And it's quite possible that I missed some detail here. Uh, we are going to have to wrap this up at this point. So what I will do is I'm going to do the same thing I did the networking section. I'll go back and I will finish um, and I'll put the recording up. Because I, I, I really like having the questions and the conversation. I think that's the important thing here. Um, Ivan was having this whole conversation with me about, oh, you might want to consider doing flipped, flipped classroom. And I'm like, that's actually what I'm mostly used to. Because when you do an online course, what happens is people watch the videos you know, at 4x speed while they're doing six other things. Um, and then they come and ask questions. So I don't want to discourage that. And I'd rather not lose piecing in the class because there's a lot of material to go, to go through here. And with that, I'm going to ask if there are any questions. And if not, then I'll call it a wrap for today. You guys can go have something to eat or, you know, go to your next course. Thanks. And that's going to be it for the streaming and the recording.